Hello everyone. My name is Mahmoud Ahmed Mohammed, student in the Department of History. And these days, I'm thinking a lot about death and dying. Not my own, of course, that's a little morbid, but really the study of death and dying and the contested history of this in a particular geography. Uh, you see, I am a Somali, Somali American now, and the region that we're gonna talk about today is called Bilad al-Somal. You might be wondering, where is that really? Bilad al-Somal, of course, is what we now call the Horn of Africa, but historically was a land that incorporated Somalia proper, Djibouti, eastern Ethiopia, and northwestern, northeastern Kenya. Uh, like all good things, colonists must ruin it, and so over time, this land was partitioned between the colonial powers. And this handsome fellow here is myself, much happier as a PhD student, as a nomad than a PhD student, probably with better job prospects as well. <laughs> Islam enters the Horn of Africa in the seventh century. The earliest people who bring this new faith to this land are, of course, merchants and holy men. Uh, their memory is constructed via the, sh the tombs and the shrines, which are, uh, really dedicated to their memory. And of course, some of the oldest and the earliest ones uh, even face Jerusalem. In fact, today all Muslims face and pray towards Mecca, but the earliest prayer niches face that direction, a testament to how long the faith had been in the region. And like religious proselytizers, these men, these holy men and women, they serve as guides. They serve as mediators, peacemakers. And when they die, their charismatic memories are transformed into shrines and tombs, which are the kind of the continuation of their legacy in this land. Uh, these become, of course, ritualized practices, which then become uh, a set of practices in which memory is always reconstructed and renegotiated. And you can see this in this picture here of a shrine dedicated to the Somali saint, Abu Bakr al-Mihdhar, in central Somalia. This is not even a picture from very long ago. And so the con continuation between an older practice and the newer practice of veneration. But the earliest shrines weren't like that. The earliest shrines, in fact, really the earliest graves were very simple how the, the earliest Muslims were buried. They were unassuming, simple structures. They were not funerary complexes or resplendent architecture. This is how the Prophet Muhammad and his companions would have been buried. And in fact, this practice is still maintained in many parts of the Muslim world today. But over time, these early graves become shrines, sites of memory, uh, sites of remembrance, trying to touch and reach back into the charisma of these early Muslims and these early a religious holy man. This is the shrine of Ibrahim al-Zaylai, a 13th century saint in northern Somalia. You can see the rich cloth inlaid with gold and silk. It looks a little bit run down, but it's almost 800 years old, so you can see why. Over time, these shrines become funerary complexes, like this one. The funerary complex of Sheikh Sufi, who dies in 1904, a saint and, holy, and a, a miracle work and a holy man whose shrine is here, but also smaller graves of his adherents and his descendants. And today it's even maintained by his descendants. These complexes become sacred geographies unto themselves. They become schools, they become monasteries, where well, monastery is a little bit of a Christian term, but more houses of men of wisdom, women of wisdom. They take on a life of their own, they transform over time, deeply connected to the charismatic memory of this holy man. But not everybody's on the same page with this. This is one way of knowing, which we call Sufism, a more spiritually inclined uh, way of knowing. All of this is embodied. In fact, when people want to call upon God, they see these holy men as their intercessors. And the barakah, the blessing of these holy men and women, is their connection to the Lord. The great American philosopher Christopher Wallace, better known as Biggie Smalls, maintains that life continues after death, of course, in that very famous album. The potency of barakah, or blessings, continues even after the shaykh, the holy man's passing. For Sufis, the soul of the dead saint remains alive in his inert but incorruptible body, a testament to his power on earth and his power from beyond the grave. But not everybody's on the same page about this. Of course, two very distinct ways of knowing. On the other side, trying to see the other side, really, these reformers, a number of holy men who oppose this practice vehemently. For example, the 19th century saint, Haji Ali Majerten. He was an incredible critic of this practice. He saw it as unnecessary, that individuals need not call on an intercessor to, to reach the most high. And he wrote tracts, religious tracts and poetry against this practice. 
And his was an intellectual endeavor. He was writing, and you can see kind of the colonialists hanging out in the back, uh, kind of monitoring, making sure things are okay. But his was really a desire to write and sit through this intellectually. Another form of reform was often violent. This is Muhammad Abdullah Hassan, known to the British as the Mad Mullah, an incredibly famous and well-known anti-colonial figure, but not uncontested in his own lifetime as an opponent, and a very violent opponent at times, of religious veneration of saints and ancestors. Two distinct approaches, one textual and one martial. Today, these long legacies remain. Uh, it's a bit reductive to say that there's an immediate connection between those two, but the broad contours are the same. This is the terror group Al-Shabaab, in, in English, the youth. For them, reform is a return to the pristine Islam of the earliest generations. They see the imposition and the construction of graves and shrines and mausoleums as foreign practices, either African in origin or Middle Eastern. For them, these are not really, the, most of the early Muslims were not buried in these complex and overly complicated and resplendent architecture. Theirs were simple graves. And so, because they neither possess the desire nor really the capacity to debate intellectually, they destroy these graves. Uh, this is the, the grave of a very famous saint named Oasis Barawi in southern Somalia. In 2009, they make a habit really of destroying these graves onward. They destroy about 300 graves a year uh, between 2009 and 2015. And actually, the flag here is a callback to the pristine Islam of the past the symbol of the earliest Muslims, the flag, the emblem of the Prophet Muhammad. For them, the past is a time to be returned to, but also something to be destroyed. For them, they must erase the past in order to relive a certain past. Today in this geography and in this beautiful country that has seen hard times and hopefully will see better times, the state now sees itself as the intercessor, funny word, right, coming back, of these debates. Whereas in the past, holy men, religious scholars, it was their uh, prerogative to debate these, whether it was via tracts or poetry on religious texts. Now a new authority is on the scene. This was uh, a few weeks ago actually in the capital of Mogadishu, where the central government brought together scholars of different theological, ethnic, uh, and even uh, really intellectual traditions and asked them to begin to mediate these conflicts. Whether or not the state will be successful in this regard remains to be seen. But I want to leave you with this. How do you think about those who have passed? And how does the long shadow, really the scepter of those we love, we venerate, we remember, how does it hang over the living? Even though this is a very particular example in a very particular context, these are ultimately universal truths. How do the dead walk among us today? How do you venerate them, remember them, and contest their very long legacies? Thank you so much, and uh, think about that.